Having covered formulating research questions, methodologies and theories, and writing proposals, abstracts and titles for independent research projects like dissertations, in the previous three videos, we now come to writing, structure and referencing. Much of the advice which follows builds on the essay writing skills outlined in video 2, so I recommend viewing that if you haven't already done so as you prepare to write up your research. By now you should have gone through the stages of developing the research question, identifying and applying appropriate theoretical approaches or methodology and have a clear sense of the shape and objectives of your project from writing the proposal or abstract and title. Before looking in depth at issues around structuring, writing and referencing in your project, here's some general advice. Before writing up, organise your thoughts. Try to form a clear narrative for your argument using lists, plans and diagrams. Whatever methods best help you visualise and articulate your ideas. Allow your thesis, that is your research question, to guide you. Consult it often so your intentions are always clear and fresh. If information comes to light that troubles your question, address it and be flexible, but avoid being flighty. If no immediate issues arise, ply on. You also need to challenge your question. Does it make presuppositions or take a position? If so, what are they? Might your question need a more neutral stance to give your argument more space and objectivity? Consider what contexts need explanation, how you'll go about this, and how early in your project they need to be outlined. Ask yourself, what is the emphasis of my project? Keep the answer written in a place where you'll see it regularly and bear it in mind in any contextual explanations you include. Good, detailed, labelled notes will make these tasks easier. Sketch your argument. Give logical order to the points that build to address the core thesis. Create a visual map, for example, spider diagrams, flowcharts, lists, whatever works for you. This will help you connect points that complement and bolster each other, strengthening your argument. It will also make visible any overlaps and incongruities that could weaken your argument if not addressed. To outline the write-up, use the sketch to identify the most appropriate structure to support your thesis, that is, in what order the strands of your argument and the points that build them should appear. It might be useful to use post-its or scrap paper to write individual points and rearrange to work out the most effective order. Try different combinations, and even if you think you find the right one, challenge it. Ask yourself, are all the main points relevant to the thesis or research question? Does the thesis or research question determine the outline? Can points be moved freely, or does a pattern emerge in which some points are dependent upon others first being established? Does the argument progress or stall at any point? When you can address these issues, the writing up process proper can begin. As a project example, undergraduate dissertations in the UK tend to be around 7,000 to 10,000 words long and so differ from essays in that they need to be broken up and presented in clearly delineated sections, usually chapters. The chapters need to do the work of making their own argument, while being a sum part of the dissertation's total. Every section works towards presenting and evidencing your research findings take time to map out the flow and decide on the distribution of the word count. Taking a 10,000 word dissertation as an example, I recommend splitting the word count roughly into 1,500 words for the introduction and literature review, 2,500 words for three chapters, and a 1,000 word conclusion. As well as making the project's presentation orderly, these smaller word counts will help with organisation and provide less daunting goals to reach than the full amount. Set yourself a timetable with sub-deadlines to keep you well on track. 
and to spread the workloads. Doing smaller amounts on a regular basis and trading yourself when you've reached a goal or deadline is a good incentive to build it up over time instead of cramming it in the final week. On the structure of your dissertation, many of the same rules apply as for essay writing, but the word count does need to be managed as suggested, with distinct chapters or sections that also connect to make the whole. Where I advise having several related strands of an argument running parallel, then being drawn together in an essay, the dissertation chapters give you space to do this in much greater depth and detail. That each component is stretched out does not permit or encourage waffly filler. Every word counts, and every word must work towards addressing your research question. As with essays, the introduction ought to provide a map for the whole document, which signposts relevant context, methodology, argumentation, the corpus and conclusions. The literature review's function is to establish all the contextual research and methodological approaches that form the basis for your analysis and argumentation. These should be well established, as per videos 5, 6 and 7, before you write up the project findings. In some cases, instructors recommend having this as a separate section or chapter between the introduction and first analytical chapter. I think the literature review is most effectively positioned within the introductory section as I feel it establishes better flow. As ever, follow your institution or instructor's guidance. If you have a choice, use your best judgement on what feels right for your writing skills and works best for clarity in your project. How you order and decide on the topics of your chapters really comes down to the nature of your research question, methodology and findings. Take on board the specialist advice given by your assigned supervisor and critically evaluate your own ideas and writing. In a similar way to paragraphs, but on a much larger scale, chapters should both stand alone and clearly build from the previous while laying the groundwork for the next. By this stage, you should have become expert enough on the issues your research question raises and proficient enough at this stage of your education to make these important judgments. This is where you will need to emerge as an independent scholar. As with shorter essays, the conclusion is a space to draw together your findings in summary, punch home what your research means and its significance, and to clearly situate it in the bigger picture. If you're looking at something historical, why does it remain relevant? What's the use in re-evaluating old work? If you're studying more contemporary elements of culture, production, society or politics, then what does it indicate about the past, present and future? Are you demonstrating notable shifts? Or that in fact nothing has really changed? Why would either outcome be important knowledge? Can you reflect on your dis discipline, what changes still need to happen, what problems still need fixing, how might that come about, what further inquiry must take place. Remember to justify any answers you have for such questions supported by the findings you've presented. Avoid drawing upon entirely new and unflagged information at this stage, as it risks derailing your whole argument. Try to keep it tight while showing awareness of the broader issues at stake directly related to your project's main aims and concerns. In addition to redrafting and proofreading your writing, it's worth allowing time to ensure accuracy in your referencing throughout your work and in the final work cited or bibliography at the end. This is something I always do as I go as it's easy to forget where information came from, especially when spending months working towards a substantial piece of coursework. Adding to what I explain in video 2, a frustrating aspect of many style guides for those of us researching contemporary cultural production is that they're still playing catch up with shifts in the technological landscape. It can be difficult to know how best to cite legally streamed or downloaded films, television programs, ebooks, artworks, live events, music recitals, podcasts, YouTube videos, 
blog posts, tweets, or Instagram posts, and so on, because guides often privilege print and other more established media. When I studied for my film degree, the department provided its own style guide for referencing films. If your institution or department does this, then defer to that guide. If you've been instructed to use a named official guide, but find it doesn't cater to your needs, read its rules carefully and construct your own method of presenting the citation based on how it works for other media. If citations are consistent and vital information is provided clearly, you shouldn't encounter any problems. If you are or have a representative of a staff student committee for your department, this kind of issue is useful to raise as it causes unnecessary stress for students and is time consuming for tutors. And style guides really ought to be adapting alongside the cultural products we study in the arts and humanities. When completing my PhD work cited, I found a style guide in my university library, made specifically for electronic sources. I was examining a range of video installations, exhibitions, live performance art, photographs, sculptures and paintings as well as films, so I needed a more flexible approach to referencing than was covered by the 2008 second edition of the MHRA guide I was using. Although having been published in the early 1990s, Electronic Style provided the closest information for my needs and I used its rules to suit the different media I needed to reference. As I said, be consistent, informative and clear, but also double check with your instructor or supervisor. They may even appreciate the initiative you take and sharing what you come up with. To show an example, this screenshot from my PhD works cited lists exhibitions and events I discuss in the study, but on which I struggled to find referencing guidance. Combining the MHRA structure for publications with what I learned in the electronic style guide, I settled on the events title in italics, the year in brackets, the main people or organisation involved, the mode of presentation in square brackets, the venue, the place, and the date span. As shown, the list is arranged alphabetically. Typically, numbered titles would go ahead of the A's, but where I've listed the 9th and 10th between A's and B's, they're referring to the Belfast Film Festival. I'd probably place these at the top now and with a lot more detail, but believe me, the glitches present here aren't bad for a 25 page long works cited. Final year or master's dissertation bibliographies tend to be much more manageable than this. Many instructors provide access to anonymised past dissertations to give students a clear sense of the expected layout, structure and presentation. If this isn't the case at your institution, ask if it would be possible. A useful exercise I found when teaching on preparatory dissertation modules was to prepare copies of past dissertations of varied quality with the marks removed. I then got students to read them in groups and apply the marks scheme to grade them, justifying why they arrived at the marks they would award using the criteria. I then revealed the actual grades each earned. The cohort I did this with gained a clear sense of how much research and detail was needed to produce high quality, high scoring scholarship. If your instructor is unable to do this with you, I recommend self-organising into peer groups, if you can, to review and evaluate each other's draft work using your provided examination criteria. On presentation, follow your institution's guidelines. Often, dissertations require soft binding, as they are usually large documents, but this isn't the case everywhere, so do seek clarification. A quick note on including images, screenshots, diagrams or tables. Be sure to be thorough in interacting with them in your text. If you include long quotations or paraphrase a published scholar's ideas at length, your analysis should examine these thoroughly and ought to clearly integrate the evidence into your argument. The same applies for visual evidence. It should not be decorative or expected to speak for itself.
It is up to you to explain the meaning, significance and relevance of all evidence to the examiner. Remember, marks cannot be given where these are expected to be self-evident. It's better to explain what feels obvious and show what you know than to not explain and risk seeming ignorant. Unless your institution stipulates that visual evidence must appear in appendices, try to include any captioned images and so on as close to the relevant text as possible. Seek help with formatting if this proves difficult. There are loads of videos on YouTube to meet any specific formatting needs that arise. Throughout this hard work, you mustn't push yourself too hard. Keeping well is also an effort and your work can only benefit from your good health. When I was a student, I made the mistake of believing that scholarly work was the best distraction for the emotional, financial and mental struggles I faced and that I was weak if I admitted to not coping. The trouble with embarking on long-term studies is that life doesn't pause so you can get on with them. It is a sign of strength, not weakness, to admit you're struggling if you are and to seek help. The research and writing process, while often enjoyable, is difficult and requires hard graft. If you find it tough, know that you're not alone and be kind to yourself and to others. Remember that all you can do is your best and for extra peace of mind, remember to back up your files. If you find this presentation interesting or useful, please share and subscribe to my YouTube channel and thanks if you do. I provide these videos for free. They take a lot of time and work to prepare on pretty clunky old equipment. If you feel able to make a financial contribution to video production and upgrading my equipment and software, please donate via paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair or pay a monthly subscription of any amount you choose in US dollars on patreon.com forward slash PEA Blair. Pledges of any amount on Patreon will enable access to transcriptions of my videos that include bibliographical references and links to further information. My Patreon page also links to the Audiovisual Cultures podcast, my other videos, blog posts and publications. Any money received goes towards sustaining and improving the educational resources I make and will facilitate the development of a website I'm designing dedicated to wide, accessible, inclusive study of audio and visual cultures. If you'd like to arrange a consultation about your work, search for my profile on upwork.com. Thanks so much for watching. Mm -hmm.